Hey there. I offer this podcast freely. Your support really makes a difference. To make a donation, visit ReneeMcKenna.com. Welcome to Spiritual Psychology. My name is Renee LaValle McKenna, and I bring my 30 plus years as a recovering addict and ex crazy person turned therapist and shamanic healer to bring you snackable teachings on spirituality, psychology, and all things personal growth. And today I want to talk about authenticity. And Merriam Webster Dictionary has named authenticity as the word of the year. Who knew there was a word of the year? But that's it. And I guess in an age of deep fakes, post-truths, and AI, we may have reached a crisis of authenticity. According to the data analyzer of Merriam-Webster, Authentic saw a big uptick in searches this year. So apparently, as what's real becomes less clear, authenticity is something that we're thinking about, writing about, and perhaps aspiring to more than ever before. The authenticity, or the root word authentic, describes something that's real or genuine, as opposed to being fake or counterfeit. And the fake authentic dynamic exists all over the place. There's fake and authentic diamonds and watches. So you can go down to Times Square and buy a Rolex for 10 bucks, or you can go over to Madison Avenue and buy one for $15,000. There's fake and authentic information. Fake or real information can be very challenging to discern. There was a big controversy about 10 years ago with the book Three Cups of Tea, It's a true story of a young American mountain climber, Greg Mortensen, stumbles into a tiny village high in the Pakistan mountains and ended up starting a nonprofit to promote education and literacy, especially for girls in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And their nonprofit, the Central Asia Institute, apparently had some financial records issues and Mortensen was accused of financial irregularities in handling donations an improper use of funds. He ended up paying back a million dollars to the organization. But his co-author, David Rellin, killed himself in 2012, somehow amidst the controversy. And because there was some lack of integrity, it called the whole story of what happened in Pakistan into question. And people started to say he made the whole thing up, which apparently he didn't, but it can be difficult to tell what's true and what's false. And all that points to what I'm most interested in, which is the value of authenticity as a person. And simply put, authenticity means you're true to your own personality, to your values, to your spirit, regardless of the pressure that you're under to act differently. If you're authentic, you're honest with yourself and with others, and you take responsibility for your mistakes. And when our values and ideals our actions, and our feelings are in alignment, we can just be our true self. The great value and benefit of authenticity is the incredible confidence that stems from self-trust. People who live authentically are more confident in their abilities because they are honest with themselves. They know what they have to offer, and they know where they need to improve. And when we have integrity, when our mind and our heart and our actions are in alignment, we trust ourselves and we are trustworthy. So others trust us as well. And I had a really great conversation with Chris DiStefano on my YouTube channel. He's an integrative acupuncturist and fellow cosmonaut, explorer of consciousness. And we were talking about the word trust. And we came to agree that the word trust is probably more important than the word love for most people. I know it is for me. There's a lot of people I love, but there's very few people I trust. To be perfectly honest, I don't even really like the word love very much because it's thrown around so casually and so much. And it's such an enormous concept, whether in religious or spiritual circles, whether in relationship. We just have this one tiny word for this massive concept of how we attach to, admire, desire, or offer goodwill to other people, places, and things. The ancient Greeks had seven words for the different kinds of love. Romantic love, friendly love, universal love, familial love, and flirtatious love. 
I talk more about that in podcast number 58, Need Versus Love. So while love is incredibly complicated, trust is perhaps more simple. And I'm kind of a word nerd. I love etymology, the history of words and how they develop, because words define the concepts that we hold. And the concepts that we hold are very tied to our beliefs, and our beliefs often drive our experience. So the words we use and the meaning they hold are very tied to our own co-creation of reality. And looking deeply at the words that we use in our own self-talk and the words that we use with others, and being more accurate with our speech, more accurate, honest, or authentic about how we communicate really has implications for the quality of our experience. I'm incredibly selective about the information that I consume, just like I'm choosy about the food that I eat or the people that I hang out with. I spent too many years as an open garbage can. You could put whatever you want inside. I had no boundaries, no self-care, and it was obvious because I was a train wreck, alcoholic, drug addict, bulimic, hated my body, lived in anxiety and depression. I was untrustworthy, inauthentic, and because water seeks its own level, I was attracted to and spent time with many other untrustworthy, inauthentic people. And I spent enough years as a drug addict, petty criminal, and very practiced liar that all the layers of the different social masks that I wore, and even my internal imagery of myself was so skewed, I had no idea who I really was. In fact, my greatest fear was that I was actually my lowest self, the fearful, angry, bitter young woman that I had become. That's what the terrible inner critic in my head used to tell me. And I don't have that inner critic anymore because a dedicated path to authenticity, integrity, and truth has over time cleared all that stuff away. Now, I'm not done. I still have to do my laundry both internally and externally, because we're always a little bit smelly somewhere just because of the natural process of inflow, digestion, and outflow on all levels and our interaction with this complicated world. But another one of the great values of practicing being real is that it is very easy to tell when I'm out of alignment. And when I'm being inauthentic, I'm manipulating I'm hiding, I'm self-centered, even if I'm trying to be good. It's all about creating a fake image of who I think I should be or who I think you want me to be and a complete lack of faith or connection that who I really am is lovable, valuable, and acceptable. And it can be quite terrifying to self-reveal But one of the greatest spiritual principles that I use foundationally in my life is that the truth will set us free. And there's this fabulous quote from the Gnostic Gospels, which were all these scrolls found in the 1940s in Nag Hammadi. There were 52 texts that didn't make it into the Bible. And Elaine Pagels wrote a book about them, among other people. And this quote is attributed to the Gospel of James, who is believed to be Jesus' younger brother. And it reads, If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. And that is the danger of being fake. And it doesn't even have to mean that we're an overt liar. It's about the lies of omission the things we don't share, what we hide, that perverts and putrefies within us this lie that who we really are is unlovable and unacceptable. And it is the core of my spiritual psychology work to help people uncover and reveal their most authentic self, because we are created to be who we are here. It's not a mistake. It can take tremendous courage and a lot of support and help certainly has for me and continues to, to express my most authentic self in the world. But it is absolutely the path to joy, fulfillment, empowerment, abundance that I was always seeking. There's a metaphor I like to use that life 
is like a garden, and we are all plants and flowers in this complex ecosystem. And some of us may be little insects or part of the organic soil or the air. We're all part of this environment that's interdependent on itself. Complex, living, growing system. But if I grow up in a family of tulips and I'm actually a rose, I'm kind of screwed if I'm trying to be a tulip. And the tulips are all blooming in the springtime and they're like, what's wrong with you? You don't have any flowers yet. And then my rose self is all blooming all summer, and they're like, cut that out. You're supposed to be down under the ground making another bulb. What's wrong with you? And so I'm trying my best to be a tulip. I'm a crappy tulip. And when I can embrace my own rose nature, thorns and all, then I can reach the full expression of myself and the beauty of the uniqueness that each of us brings. It may not make the tulips happy, but growing in trust and expression of who and what I really am, all of it, brings me into integrity, self-acceptance, and is actually beneficial to other people. If you listen to this podcast, you know I talk about all kinds of shit. (laughs) Because I made the decision to self-reveal for the benefit of others. Because other people who had the courage to self-reveal to me literally saved my life. The woman who helped me get clean and sober, was a street prostitute. She'd been to prison for shoplifting. She had lost custody of her daughter because she was such a mess. She was also an accomplished writer, had helped start Rolling Stone magazine in a period where she wasn't shooting heroin, and had been married to a relatively famous intellectual who I used to listen to on public radio. So she could have told me the shiny story about who she was, and she did. But if she left out the darker parts... I would not have trusted that woman and been open to the love and guidance that she offered me that completely changed my life. And that guidance was basically, if you're an addict, you're following a lie by using whatever substance you're using, and you need to stop and face who you really are. And you don't have to do that alone. But again, what is within you, if you bring it out, it will save you. And what is within you, if you do not bring it forth, it will destroy you. And that is a spiritual law. And I'm going to end with this fabulous little poem called The Man in the Mirror by Dale Wimbro. When you get all you want in your struggle for self and the world makes you king for a day, then go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what that man has to say. For it isn't your mother or your father or wife whose judgment upon you must pass, but the man whose verdict counts most in your life is the one staring back from the glass. He's the fellow to please, never mind all the rest, for he's with you right through to the end. And you've passed your most difficult test if the man in the glass is your friend. You may be like Jack Horner and chisel a plum and think you're a wonderful guy, but the man in the glass says you're only a bum if you can't look him straight in the eye. You can fool the whole world down the highway of years and take pats on the back as you pass. But your final reward will be heartache and tears if you've cheated the man in the glass. Thank you so much for listening. Deep appreciation to my supporters on Patreon and through this podcast. Blessings on your path until we meet again. This is Renee LaValle McKenna for Spiritual Psychology.